Well, last week, Pastor Dan wrapped up his series going through the book of Esther. <clears throat> that was titled Unseen God. It was a great series. I really enjoyed it. I'm confident that you all did too. Um, and before we begin the next series that we're going through for the summer, which is entitled, um, Tough, you have it on your, your thing, but it's called Toughest Teachings. Yes. Um, before we begin that, Pastor Dan, since he's out of town today, um, invited me to preach a message of my choosing. And so I decided to follow up on a sermon that I preached last month that was called Seeing God. And so this is kind of a, a part two, but don't feel like if, if you missed the previous sermon, it's okay. You're, you're going to be just fine following along today. Uh, but last, the, the sermon that I preached last month <coughs> called Seeing God was about uh, Moses, seeing God, or the back of God, on Mount Sinai, in this special kind of one-of-a-kind event. But there's actually another passage in Scripture that it parallels that encounter um, with another prophet named Elijah. So we'll look at that today. <clears throat> but I begin with a question. Have you ever felt like the world's going crazy? <laughs> Or perhaps, you know, just our country. I mean, I, I think it's, it's spread to the whole world, but, and it's not just the pandemic. If you listen to enough news, um, you'll hear about really, or even just pay attention to enough of our culture. You'll, you'll see what it looks like for a people who calls evil good and good evil, who puts darkness for light and light for darkness, who put bitter for sweet, sweet for bitter, those who are wise in their own eyes and clever in their own sight. And that's quoting from Isaiah 5, verse 20 and 21. But that can be said of our culture and really of the world at large. There are many examples. Some may not strike you as being especially important, but there is, that come to my mind, the, the ra racist ideology of critical race theory that's being spread. There's the celebration, without question, of sexual confusion and sexual distortion that's also just being pushed on our children of, of all ages. There's the widespread devaluing of the unborn life, not to mention our culture's complete indifference toward the shirking of paternal responsibilities of fathers who are abandoning either children or wife in, that are pregnant. You know, it goes on down the list from normalizing lust on screen to idolizing science, however we define that, or idolizing human ingenuity, idolizing money, power, and the list goes on. To be sure, I don't think it's all doom and gloom, but it definitely isn't difficult to think of the many ways that large parts of our culture and country are getting off track. And isn't it true that all of these failures, all of these different faults, missing the mark, comes back to a root cause of rejecting God and his word, rejecting his authority and the story that he's trying to tell. And I apologize for starting out this message on such a low note. I don't mean to be a downer, and I'm not trying to stir up controversy for controversy's sake, um, but I've been reflecting on a passage in scripture that takes place during a period in Israel's history when it seemed like the whole nation had decided to reject Yahweh, to reject his ways. And it led to um, idol worship, to injustice, um, and really to a persecution of those who did try to uphold the word of Yahweh. So allow me to set up the story. It's found in the book of 1 Kings. It takes place centuries after Moses. Um, Israel was brought to the promised land, if you know the story of, Mo of Israel, throughout the Old Testament. Um, you know, they're led into the promised land under the leadership of Joshua. They have centuries then beyond that when they finally become a kingdom, and a king is, is implemented, uh, Saul, and then David, and then Solomon. And then after Solomon, the nation splits into two. And so you have the northern nation now called Israel and the southern nation called Judah and Judah kept the Davidic line the the sons of David remained as kings and they also had 
Jerusalem as their capital. They had the temple. But while there were a few highlights, a, a few good kings, most of the, the kings that we read about did very poorly. Whereas in the north, the northern Israel kingdom, uh, they immediately set up idol worship of two golden calves, and they had a series of 20 kings from different lines, and all 20 of them were evil. And yet, God still considered himself the God of Israel and the God of Judah. And he continued to send his prophets among the people and to the leaders, calling them back to himself. And one prophet in particular stands out named Elijah. And I've always loved the stories of Elijah. They're, they're so vivid, they're so memorable, um, they're so miraculous. But it, it's not just that that I love about them. I loved how you could tell that Elijah was on a daily adventure with God. It, it took daily dependence um, because he was having to go against the grain of his culture, of those surrounding him. And God was always going to show up and do something really cool. And while we are amazed and inspired by the stories of men like Elijah, oftentimes we forget that he lived in such difficult circumstances where he chose to live in a way that was in stark contrast to those around him. Following God was, wasn't easy. It wasn't normal. You couldn't just kind of go with the flow and follow God in his day as it is in most days. It was a daily choice meeting daily resistance. And I just can't help but think that that is also how we're living in our time, in our place, where following Jesus means resisting the pulls of our culture. It means taking unpopular positions. It means choosing a different way with different values, different beliefs, and really ultimately serving a different God. With this comes a level of rejection, as it says in Matthew 5, 11 through 20, where Jesus, speaking to his disciples, says, Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, because great is your reward in heaven. For in the same way, they persecuted the prophets who were before you. And certainly one of the prophets he has in mind is Elijah, who we want to look at. Now, Elijah, during his day, um, an evil man named Ahab was king. And you probably are familiar with Ahab's wife, Jezebel, ring a bell. And that, <laughs> I didn't, <laughs> didn't mean to make that pun, but there you go. Jezebel, who uh, is really the manipulator, the pulling the strings um, to the kingdom. And she is a daughter of a king from the north, the Sidonians. And um, she immediately institutes Baal worship into the nation of Israel. And to solidify the worship of Baal in the kingdom, she murders all of the prophets of Yahweh. Well, not quite all of them, of course. We know that Elijah is preserved. And we're also told a story about how a hundred other prophets are preserved by um, a court official named Obadiah. And Elijah uh, comes before the king and he declares that there's going to be a famine in the land, that there will not be any rain until Yahweh sends his word and, and brings rain again. And so for three years, there is a drought. And then we get, after the three years where God preserves um, Elijah through different miraculous means, then he, he told, tells Elijah to go back and confront Ahab and confront the, you know, what they're doing in, in their worship of Baal, who is, by the way, a storm god who is supposed to control the weather. And so it's very ironic that now the, this storm god isn't able to bring rain for the people. And so he goes to Ahab and he confronts him and says, hey, let's have a contest. And this is a very famous story that I invite you to, to read in more detail for yourself. We're actually going to go just beyond it, but in this contest on Mount Carmel, Elijah confronts the 300 prophets of Baal, um, and they both call down for their God to send fire to, to take up a sacrifice, and obviously Baal does not send fire, but when Elijah calls out to Yahweh, he does. And there's this awesome victory 
this, this you know, mountaintop experience that is so great for Elijah. After you know, winning, fire comes down from heaven, and he thinks to himself, oh, this, this has done it. We've just proven now that Yahweh is the one true God. He's the powerful one. There's going to be revival in the land, right? That all the people have just witnessed it. The king has just witnessed it. And now rain is being brought. And so it begins to rain. And so we pick up now in 1 Kings chapter 19. What happens next? Starting in verse 1. Now, remember that this contest has just been complete. Now, Ahab told Jezebel everything Elijah had done and how he had killed the prophets with a sword. So Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah to say, May the gods deal with me, be it ever so severely, if by this time tomorrow I do not make your life like that of one of them. Elijah was afraid and ran for his life. When he came to Beersheba in Judah, all the way down in the southern kingdom, he left his servant there while he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness. He came to a broom bush, sat down under it, and prayed that he might die. I have had enough, Yahweh, he said. Take my life. I am no better than my ancestors. Then he lay down under the bush and fell asleep. This is what we might call the burnout. Elijah has now faced the, the one person as committed to Baal as he is to Yahweh, Jezebel, and she sends out this threatening message. And so, as one commentator puts it, in three short verses, the writer has totally changed the flow of the story. Victory seems to be transformed into defeat, the brave prophet into a cowering refugee, and the victory over death and Baal into an opportunity for death to reassert itself through Jezebel's oath to take Elijah's life. Another term for this that Elijah's experiencing might be depression, feeling overwhelmed, discouragement, despair, hopelessness. And if you've walked with God long enough, I think you've experienced it too. I know I have. And there's kind of a strange phenomenon where when we're in that state, it's hard to remember what normal feels like. And when you're kind of more in the happy, normal time of life, it's sometimes hard to remember that you ever went through that difficulty. I was just thinking uh, over my own life and how, you know, I've had a pretty easy life, I think. I, you know, it, it, I'm a pretty mild-mannered guy. I don't have super high highs. I don't have super low lows. Have I ever really felt like Elijah? And then I, I opened up my journal. I, I occasionally journal, not as often as I'd like to, but I've kept a journal, kind of a prayer journal, over the past probably 10 years now. And I began flipping through it and reading some of my entries, and I began to think, have I ever not been depressed? I mean, these are de <laughs> depressing uh, entries. And I think that a journal entry isn't the best gauge for um, your emotional state, because oftentimes that is when I would go to journal and I would feel the, the most release and, and benefit from it is when I'm going through a challenge. But that just goes to show how it's so easy to forget the difficulty that we go through when we're in a, a place where, you know, maybe we're not feeling it quite as strongly. And yet, this is a very common experience for, for all of God's people to go through these lows. And if you're in this place, I want you to remember that many followers of God have felt this way in times past, that even nearly 3,000 years ago, the prophet Elijah felt this way. Or listen to another man of faith from a few generations after the apostles. I love taking examples from church history just because I feel like we don't, we don't hear enough about uh, really the story of Christianity, the church throughout the ages. Well, this is taken from the year 379 AD, so very early on after the apostles. And there is a church leader, a man of faith named Gregory Nazianzen or Nazianzus. 
and he had recently heard of the death of his close friend, Basil, or Basil, 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 either one, I think. But here, I, I want to read a quote from you from a letter that he sent. He was, at this time, bodily and mentally very depressed. In a letter to the rhetorician, Eudoxius, he wrote, you ask how it fares with me. Very badly, I no longer have Basil. I no longer have Caesarius, my spiritual brother and my bodily brother. I can say with David, my father and my mother have forsaken me. My body is sickly, age is coming over my head. Cares become more and more complicated. Duties overwhelm me, friends are unfaithful, the church is without capable pastors, good declines, evil stalks naked. The ship is going in the night, a light nowhere, Christ asleep. What is to be done? Oh, there is to me but one escape from this evil case, death. But the hereafter would be terrible to me if I had to judge of it by the present state. Again, quite a depressing letter. He went on, though, to become, um, to pastor and become the bishop of a major city, Constantinople, for a short, though very successful time. And I bring him up as another example of a man of faith who experienced serious lows. You know, people of faith, I think, experience this perhaps even more than those who are not of faith. They battle depression and despair. They feel, they are, because they are faced with more blatant spiritual attack, they're actively battling sin and temptation. They're more aware of how broken the world is and how broken they are than those who have not come to a knowledge of their need for salvation. And so what is the solution to such discouragement? I don't want us to leave leave uh, on that note of burnout, but there is a rescue that takes place. And here is where we find such great encouragement in the story of Elijah. Um, and it really comes down to fixing our eyes on the God of our salvation, really Jesus, who is our hope. It's a fixing of our perspective. And it's okay to... to really fully experience the sadness and depression that life and the world can bring on us. But then we need to turn to God and see what he has to say. And so here in 1 Kings 19, verse 5, it says, after uh, Elijah lay down under the bush and fell asleep, all at once an angel touched him and said, get up and eat. He looked around, and there by his head was some bread baked over hot coals and a jar of water. He ate and drank and then lay down again. The angel of Yahweh came back a second time and touched him and said, Get up and eat, for the journey is too much for you. So he got up and ate and drank. Strengthened by that food, he traveled 40 days and 40 nights until he reached Horeb, another name for Mount Sinai, the mountain of God. There he went into a cave and he spent the night. So it's uh, in this all-time low for Elijah that we're shown some important and greatly encouraging truths about God. And the first truth, and you can fill in the blank here in your handout, Number one, that the God who cares for his servants. He cares by sending his own messengers. I love the contrast in this story. And it's, you don't pick it up in, in an English translation. I, I love our English translations. Um, but it comes through more clearly in, in Hebrew because you see that um, in verse 1, or let's see, in verse Two, it, you know, where it says, so Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah, right? And she sent this threatening, discouraging message that was meant to intimidate him. But then it says here, all at once, an angel, which the, the literal word for that in both 
um, Greek and Hebrew, uh, the word angel, as it's translated, is really the word used for messenger. It is the same word that is used for what uh, Jezebel sent to Elijah. Jezebel sent a messenger, and now a messenger is waking up Elijah. And so it's very startling. All at once, a messenger is touching him. And you almost think, if you're reading it through just naturally in Hebrew, you'd go, oh no, the messenger of Jezebel has reached him. It, it never actually says that he, the messenger had reached him yet. It says Elijah was afraid, but it doesn't tell you that the messenger had told him anything at that point. But this messenger is actually from God. And this messenger is sent to counteract the threats and the discouragement and the intimidation of the enemy and now we have the encouragement and the sustenance and life that is brought by the messenger of God. Just, you know, one way to, to find that kind of insight is to look at a, maybe a hyper-literal translation of the Bible. Um, this is actually a translation that came out just last year. It's called the Literal Standard Version. I don't really recommend it for your daily reading because it's so literal that it's almost unreadable in English. It just doesn't translate to English very well, but it does bring out some good insight and it's a good for comparing with maybe a normal translation that you typically read. But here in the literal standard version, it says, and he lies down and sleeps under a certain broom tree and behold, a messenger is reaching toward him and says to him, rise and eat. So here we have the encouragement of God, God who cares for his servants. That when we're discouraged, when we're, we're facing these challenges, we're to take heart. When the enemy is coming against us, there is hope. Take your stand and keep on standing. You're not left alone to fight. God has sent his messenger to encourage you. And this can take many forms. You know, at times it means he'll give us the strength and the boldness to face even something as severe as martyrdom, to be one of those prophets of Yahweh who has been murdered by Jezebel. But most oftentimes, it means that God is sending his provision, his, our daily bread. You know, as it says in the, it, throughout the story of Elijah that he sent him to a brook and he sent ravens to bring food to Elijah, to feed him, sustain him for a time. And then when the brook dried up, he sent him to a widow woman and she had barely anything, but then God miraculously provided um, oil and flour for them to continue living. And so here we see that after being fed by the animal realm and then being fed by other people, you now see Elijah is also fed by a divine messenger, um, an angel who prepares him a meal. Then we continue on and actually, before I get to that next point, well, I'd like to read now the, the rest of the story through verse 18. It's a longer passage, um, but we'll read through the whole thing, and then we'll make some, some further observations. So starting in verse 9. So at this point, he is now at Mount Sinai. He went into a cave and spent the night. And the word of Yahweh came to him. What are you doing here, Elijah? He replied, I have been very zealous for Yahweh, God Almighty. The Israelites have rejected your covenant, torn down your altars, and put your prophets to death with the sword. I am the only one left, and now they are trying to kill me too. Yahweh said, Go out and stand on the mountain in the presence of Yahweh, for Yahweh is about to pass by. It might sound a little familiar to you if you were here last, um, last month for the previous message. Then a great and powerful wind tore the mountains apart and shattered the rocks before Yahweh. But Yahweh was not in the wind. After the wind, there was an earthquake, but Yahweh was not in the earthquake. After the earthquake came a fire, but Yahweh was not in the fire. And after the fire came a gentle whisper. Then Elijah heard it. When he heard it, he pulled his cloak over his face 
and went out and stood at the mouth of the cave. Then a voice said to him, What are you doing here, Elijah? He replied, I have been very zealous for Yahweh God Almighty. The Israelites have rejected your covenant, torn down your altars, and put your prophets to death with the sword. I am the only one left, and now they're trying to kill me too. Yahweh said to him, Go back the way you came and go to the desert of Damascus. When you get there, anoint Hazael, king over Aram. Also anoint Jehu, son of Nimshi, king over Israel. And anoint Elisha, son of Shaphat, from Abel Mahola, to succeed you as prophet. Jehu will put to death any who escape the sword of Hazael, and Elisha will put to death any who escape the sword of Jehu. Yet I reserve 7,000 in Israel, all whose knees have not bowed down to Baal and whose mouths have not kissed him. This is the word of the Lord. And let's make a second observation of correcting our perspective of God in our time of discouragement. He's not only the God who cares for his servants, but he is the God who judges rightly. And where do I get this from this passage? It comes from the question and answer, the question and response from between Elijah and God seen here, where he asks him, what are you doing here, Elijah? And Elijah makes his case. Now, interpreters have a hard time understanding what is meant by this question to Elijah. Is it a rebuke? Is God saying, Elijah, you're not supposed to be here. But what are you doing here? Well, I don't, I don't think it's quite a rebuke. It, Elijah certainly didn't take it that way because he gives him a very literal answer, right? He says, well, this is why. You know, let me list out for you all of the charges I have against my people. But if it's not a rebuke, what else could it be? And I, I think what I see it as is an invitation for Elijah first to air his frustrations, but also to bring his, his legal case against the people. You know, that they've just had this amazing display of God's power, they should be turning to him, and yet Elijah's severely disappointed by their lack of trust in, in God. You know, one commentator named D Dale Ralph Davis, he puts it very well. He says it this way. There is an implicit tenderness in Yahweh's famous question, what are you doing here, Elijah? I contend that Yahweh's query is not reproof, but invitation. It's a double invitation, an invitation to state the case against Israel, and in so doing, to unburden his own soul. Yahweh's question is both covenantal and pastoral. It is an act of kindness, offering Elijah the opportunity to spill his concerns. Is he depressed? Is he despondent, Elijah? I think so, but over what? Over Yahweh's interests, his covenant, his altars, his prophets. Such intensity and God-centeredness seems strange to us. Indeed, it exposes our frivolity by comparison. I think we shouldn't be too critical of Elijah here. You know, how many of you have asked for God to send fire down from heaven and he did it? So we should humbly, um, you know, take a, a generous view of Elijah, I think, and understand that, you know, yes, he was discouraged. He, he did need some correcting of his perspective. In fact, I think his complaint, his charges against Israel are, uh, are correct except for one where he says, I'm the only one left. Well, previously in the story, we're already told that a hundred other prophets had been preserved through Obadiah. And so Elijah seems to be forgetting that. And he, he seems to think, I'm all alone, when that isn't quite true. But it's so good that he brings his charges, his concerns to God. And we can do that too. When we are outraged by some injustice that we might see in our culture, we're outraged by some way that, um, you know, something, our nation is getting off track in our eyes or in according as lined up through scripture. We can bring our charge to God and he can judge rightly. He is the true judge of the world. 
And then just a, a brief comment about, um, you know, at the very end of the passage where he, he makes his statement to Elijah that to go and anoint three men and that they would bring the sword. You know, that part can be a little bit confusing. We don't have a, a lot of time to address it, um, but it, it makes a lot more sense in the context of the whole story. What is he talking about in anointing a king of Aram, a king of Israel, a, a prophet to succeed him, and that they would bring the sword and clean up after each other, essentially? Well, he's talking about bringing judgment against the house of Ahab and Jezebel. And so he was go- he's going to bring, God is bringing judgment against them through a foreign nation, Aram, and so he's anointing a new king over Aram. He's going to bring a new king to replace the evil King Ahab, Jehu, who had a lot of promise. I, we don't have time for his story, but he also ends up failing miserably. And then anointing a prophet to succeed Elijah. And, and also we see that God has continually um, warned Ahab and Jezebel and given them plenty of opportunities to repent if that should bother us at all. Well, what else do we see in this passage about God? How it corrects our perspective about him in our discouragement. Number three, the God who reveals himself by his word. I could have also said the God who reveals himself in surprising ways, which is certainly true. But I wanted to keep the emphasis on his word that ministers to his servant in this passage. A still, small voice is still how I think it rings for most of us who grew up in church, uh, who maybe read the King James Version. That's how they translate what's here, a gentle whisper. I, both, both translations get the same point across, and it's a beautiful image. But we're not really told what, what is the significance of this gentle whisper. Why is God not in the, the, the wind and the earthquake and the fire? Why a still, small voice? It's a startling and arresting image, and yet we're not even given an explanation, clearly, in the passage as to why that is. We're left to ponder on it, to meditate on its meaning. And we notice how, at first, you know, it appears to contrast with how God revealed himself in a storm at Mount Sinai when he makes the covenant with Israel. But it's also kind of similar in the way that God revealed himself to Moses. Remember that when, God, when Moses saw the back of God, we're not told what he saw, but we're, we're told what he heard. And so here again, we, we don't really see anything. Instead, we're hearing a message. It also contrasts from the magnificent display of power on Mount Carmel, where God sent down the fire to burn up the sacrifice. And so we see that that amazing display of God's power didn't change the heart of the people. God can and does appear in great and miraculous ways, but what we see emphasized here is that he doesn't need a lot of flash and pizzazz, and in fact, he can just as easily reveal himself in a quiet stillness. And it's his word that has the power to create and undo. God said, let there be light, and there was light. He can, with a word, bless and curse, pronounce reward and punishment. His word, even a quiet, still word, can topple kingdoms and raise up prophets and do so much more. It reminds me of what we've been hearing about for the past couple of months, looking through the story of Esther, where God is never explicitly referenced once in the whole story, and yet he's clearly at work. It's kind of this gentle whisper that we heard of his activity. Or it it reminds me of um, a movie that came out in 2006 called The Nativity Story. Did any of you watch that? The Nativity Story, it's uh, a depiction of the Nativity Story, of Jesus, his birth, Mary's pregnancy, is quite well done. Um, And in it, Mary is a a young girl, and she's serving, um, you know, obviously she's from a poor family, so she's serving a woman in her house. And in the movie, it shows um, this woman 
telling this, actually this story from 1 Kings to a group of children in the house. And so, you know, she goes through it so dramatically, you know, and there was a great wind, and the Lord was not in the wind. And then there was a great earthquake, and the Lord was not in the earthquake. And then there was a great fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And then there was a still, small voice. And it, it's brought up in this movie, so artistically well done, to really show you that, to, to introduce, God's about to do something again, not in a huge, magnificent display of power, but in a quiet, still way. And he's going to do it through a young country girl who's not even yet married. And this is Jesus, how we see him brought on the scene in the Gospels. Um, and just another note about how this is really, I think what we're supposed to get from this is God's ultimate revelation of himself. When I say in his word, you know, oftentimes we think of, well, this is God's word, right? So we're, he reveals himself in this. But that's not what's being highlighted here in the passage. It's his spoken word, really, that's being talked about. And I, I think really the incarnate word, ultimately, that is Jesus, who is called the word. And we see that even, and we don't have a lot of time to address it, but I invite you to read um, in Matthew 17, the story of Jesus, who he, when he goes up onto a mountain, doesn't tell us which mountain he's on, but he brings a couple of his disciples up with him, and then he's transfigured before his disciples. Do you remember this story? And he begins to shine brighter than anything that could be made, brighter than the sun. He, he's shown in his ultimate glory and brilliance. And then it says two guys appeared with him at that time. Do you remember who they are? Yeah, Moses and Elijah. The two men that we've just heard about, and last month we heard about Moses seeing God on Mount Sinai, and now Elijah seeing God on Mount Sinai. And now we see what the gospel authors and, and what is being shown to the disciples in that encounter is what Moses and Elijah saw on Mount Sinai is ultimately fulfilled in the incarnate word of God in Jesus. Anyway, that's another sermon. But we'll go on um, to the for fourth point. The God who preserves the remnant. This is a very important point, and I don't think it can be stressed enough. God will preserve his remnant, even and especially when opposed by the powers of the day. And where do I get this from? Well, right there at the end, verse 18. God's reply to Elijah, after going through all this experience, this new perspective of fixing his eyes on God, he gives him the word of judgment, right, first. And there is judgment on the people, on the house of Ahab and Jezebel. And then we get also his grace. Yet I will reserve 7,000 in Israel, all whose knees have not bowed down to Baal and whose mouths have not kissed him. I love how, uh, again, I quote commentator Dale Ralph Davis on this passage. He says, this, is, this statement is the Old Testament equivalent of Jesus's, I will build my church in Matthew 16, 18. Grace will have a remnant. The God of grace insists on it. Yahweh, so the, te the text teaches, will always have a people, even an Israelite people, to worship him upon the earth. He has decided that he will have a true people and he will have them and keep them and there is nothing any Jezebel can do about it. It is the infectious assurance the defiant certainty, the holy dogmatism of this text that keeps some of us on our feet. Elijah has not been Yahweh's last broken servant. There are cases also in these new covenant days, 
it is hardly a state to be desired, and yet surely 1 Kings 19 teaches you that you needn't fear being a broken servant when you have such a kind and adequate God. Isn't that true? This text reminds us of a truth that we see consistent throughout Scripture. God preserves the remnant. You know, I, I think especially a word of encouragement to a generation or two older than myself, that if you ever feel discouraged about the younger generation, if you ever feel like, wow, they are just so off track, they're just get, getting into all kinds of craziness, you know, the, the church is diminishing, where are the young people in the church? Rest assured, God will preserve his remnant. In every generation, he will always have a witness. I find that so encouraging that there will be a people. And it won't be that they'll preserve themselves by their own strength, by their own effort, but that God, by his grace, will preserve them. And this is what we can, by the grace of God, by the merit of Jesus Christ, claim to be a part of, not out of our own righteousness, but because of his grace. And so I'd like to conclude with a few takeaways, a few uh, challenges for how, what is our response to all of this, to this fresh perspective of God, the God who cares, who judges, who reveals himself, who preserves. So what, essentially? What is it that we are to take away from this? And first is simply to have hope to be encouraged, even in the midst of a wicked generation, even when the days are evil, as it says, uh, as Paul writes, that we are to have hope, to be encouraged, and to keep on standing. But secondly, to be refreshed when you need it. I, I mean, just the simple fact that Elijah, he needed sleep. <laughs> he needed a good nap, and he needed a good meal. And I think that's so true of all of us. I mean, how many times have you felt like total despair, felt irritable, felt annoyed at, at the world around you, and then you realize, oh yeah, I didn't get enough sleep. I've gotten, you know, five hours of sleep for all week, and, or maybe even less than that. You only had three hours of sleep last night. Okay, maybe that has something to do with your irritability to feeling like the world's kind of crashing down around you and a good meal. I mean, just the simplicity of that is so encouraging in this passage. We need to be refreshed, and we can look to God who supplies our daily bread. Thirdly, to remember that you are not alone. You're not the only faithful one left. If you've ever felt like you know, you just took a stand at, in your workplace to, and you, you maybe shared with a coworker that you're a Christian or you just took a stand, uh, or you just volunteered to help um, lead a Bible study or do others some type of thing. Realize that any time you do take a stand in such a way, small or big, that you have a target on your back and yet the, the messenger of the enemy will be counteracted by God's messengers. And to realize that even when it feels like you're the only one doing it, when it feels like, oh man, eyes are on me now, where's, where's, where's my support, where are my people? Remember that you're not alone. And that is why it's so important to be in community, to be encouraged in a place like this, to have a face-to-face -face interactions of those who are other, other believers who are seeking to follow God to, see, to follow his ways. Remember, you're not alone. And lastly, and perhaps most importantly, remember to seek God's face more than his hand. Well, what do I mean by that? I mean to seek to know him and his ways even more than the miraculous power and action that you need in your life. I don't mean to say stop praying for miracles. Certainly keep on praying for those things. 
Pray for the healing that's needed. Pray for the job that's needed. Pray for all these things that we have so many. And expect it. Expect God's reply. Expect his answer to your need. But what I mean is, if God does bring the healing, does bring the job, does bring, he, he does end the drought, so to speak. He does rid the world of the plague. You're no better off if you're not also actively seeking him in his ways. What good is it to be healthy and to still be lost? Ultimately, death will come for all. There'll be an end. And if we get that healing, oh, great. Well, maybe we're just a little bit more comfortable for a few more years. Maybe we get to continue to live on for a bit more. But ultimately, it leads to nothing if we're not also seeking his face, seeking his true and abundant and eternal life, to love him more deeply, to seek to follow him and obey him, and to surrender to his loving will. And I think this is what we see in God not being in the miraculous. The miraculous went before God. It happened, and it was important. But God was not in the wind or the earthquake or the fire. He was in the still, small voice. And that is what we should also seek. I'm reminded of a passage in 2 Chronicles chapter 7, a very famous verse, but I'd like to conclude with it here. 2 Chronicles 7, 13 and 14. When I shut up the heavens so that there is no rain, or command locusts to devour the land, or send a plague among my people, if my people who are called by my name, will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. Then I will hear from heaven and I will forgive their sin and will heal their land. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your tender care for your people. What was true of Elijah is, is true today of you who cares for us, who provides what we need, who judges the world rightly. That even when we're a little bit off, when we might get annoyed at something or, or frustrated by something, but Lord, you see through it all, you see beyond it all, and you bring justice in your timing. And we trust in that timing and in your ways. We thank you for your grace. We thank you for your patience with us and with those around us. Lord, help us to seek your face, to expect also the miraculous, but first to just want to get to know you more. Lord, surround us in this community with encouragement by those around us. Lord, that we would never come to think that we're the only ones. We thank you, Lord, for for your grace that's expressed through your people and help us to show it also. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Well, I invite you to stand with me as I conclude with a benediction out of Jude, verses 24 and 25. To him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you before his glorious presence without fault and with great joy. To the only God, our Savior, be glory, majesty, power, and authority through Jesus Christ our Lord before all ages, now and forevermore. Amen.